Welcome to our webinar on how to stay competitive in a DIY world. I'm Senior Consultant Danielle Davis Rowe here from Infinity Consulting Group, and I have helped a lot of law firms figure out how to transform their businesses to be more competitive for those clients out there who are used to doing things themselves. You can find a video on YouTube these days for just about anything. People are out there trying to help themselves save some money and they find it rewarding to take care of things themselves. So we're going to talk about how we can better provide them legal services for the things that they truly value. And we might even be able to get a higher hourly rate for doing work that's more fulfilling for us that they value more, less administrative burdens for us all around a win win. There's a few keys to success, and I want to make sure we address those up front. The first is security. In this day and age, we have to make sure that everything we do is secure. Our communications with our clients are secure. Our documents and their data is secure. And I want to make sure that you guys don't accidentally disclose anything to the public that shouldn't be disclosed. Then we're going to want to make sure that we reduce paper. The less we rely on paper, the easier it's going to be to allow these clients to help themselves and to collaborate with them. We might also need to engage in some new communication methods. Our younger generations are very unlikely to pick up the phone and call. They're also unlikely to use email. They are big fans of texting and we want to make sure that we're able to support them with their desire to communicate by texting. We also want to make sure that we enable them to help themselves as much as possible. So we're going to let them do as much as they possibly can, right? So that they've engaged us for legal advice, legal counsel, right? That's why we went to law school is to provide people with legal advice. It wasn't to do a whole bunch of administrative work, which a lot of a law firm practice is if we don't have the right tools and technology involved to make it easy for them to help themselves or to automate it. When I say that they're trying to save money, I don't mean that they're not willing to pay you for your time. They absolutely are. They are willing to pay for legal advice. They simply don't want to pay for things like data entry, things that they could take care of themselves. And this is how you can get a higher hourly rate where you truly matter because you're letting them take care of all the stuff that's not as valuable, but actually that's not as valuable, but actually needs to be done to successfully represent your client. There's four steps that we want to take. First, we want to talk about client intake. Here, we want to think about when we are scheduling clients, how we're going to make it easy for them, right? Because we said that they do not want to talk on the phone. They don't want to pick up the phone and call us to schedule an initial appointment. We also want to think about our retainer agreement and our intake forms and how we can leverage our clients desire to do more and deal with paper a whole lot less. Then we want to talk about how we're going to share information with our clients. Things like client portals and shared document locations to allow us to collaborate more effectively. Then we want to talk about how to get paid. How are we going to make it easy for these clients to pay us so that we can get paid faster? And then finally, how can we allow them to engage in self-help while still getting the advice that they need and getting compensated for our legal services? All right, let's dive into that first key to success, security, in a little bit more detail, because this is going to lay a proper foundation for everything you're going to be doing to help out these DIY clients. We want to make sure that we're not violating any of our ethical duties, right? That's super important. And all of our rules these days talk about the need to preserve client data. The truth is that with security comes inconvenience. The more secure we make everything, the less convenient it is. That is just a fact. So you need to accept that and understand that it is worth it 
to withhold your ethical duties and protect your client data, that it's going to be a little bit less convenient. I'm not saying it's going to be hard to work, but we might have a few more hoops to jump through to get started. Now, this webinar is not focused on security. We could talk about security for days on end, but we've only got one hour together today. So I am hitting some of the big highlights that you want to make sure are on your radar. The first is two-factor authentication. This sends a code to your phone that you enter in addition to your password. You may have seen this, right? You go, you log in with your username and password, and it says, hold on, I'm gonna text you a number and you have to enter it here. It's annoying to have to pull out your phone to get that number, whether it's a text or from a multi-factor authentication app, but it confirms it's you logging in. As much as we'd like to think, no one else is ever going to have access to our passwords. Passwords get hacked into all the time. And the way that this protects your client data is that if someone tries to log in who doesn't have your phone, they're not going to have access to that second factor of authentication. They're not going to have access to that text message or to your MFA which stands for multi-factor authentication application. And so they won't be able to get into your account and they won't be able to get to the data. Now, not every service has this option. I'm seeing it more and more every day, but not everyone's caught up to the need for this. So check with all of your accounts, see if they've added it. They may have added it and not let you know, and you might have to dive into the settings to enable it. It's typically optional to turn it on, but you want to make sure that you're taking advantage of it and dive into those settings to see if you have it. When you set it up, a lot of them will give you 10 or so backup codes. Make sure you save those someplace secure because if for some reason you lose your phone or the app breaks, something goes wrong, you can use those to get into your account without your phone. Many of them have the option to either call or text you with the code. You're going to have to make sure to take advantage of those that you have cell phone service. I know a lot of courthouses still don't have great cell phone service, right? They're buildings that were built a long time ago. They're tall. They have a lot of steel and it really interferes with the cell service. And so if you're going down to court, that may not work as well. You could use a landline for this option to have it call you, not text you, right? But then you're only going to be able to access your account when you are at the location of the landline and you can answer it. And how many of us have a landline anymore anyways? And this can also be challenging if you're logging in from a cell phone, if you have them call you with the code, right? Because then you've got to remember the six digit code long enough to plug it in, which for some people is easy. For others of us, that can be a little challenging. Text messaging is an option more often than calling. But as we said, you're going to have to have cell phone service to take advantage of it. And most newer cell phones show you the text and whatever app you were in. So the text pops up at the top of your screen and it's easy to see the code and type it at the same time. Some of them even immediately put the code on your clipboard and paste it into wherever you were, saving you a whole bunch of steps. Those of you with older phones, particularly ones that don't get updates to the current version of your operating system, this may not work as well because you might have to go over into your text message in app and then switch back over. And again, just like a phone call, then you have to remember those six digits there typically. This can also be an issue if someone hijacks your SIM, right? We've got SIM cards that we put in our phone when we get them new, and it's possible for people to hijack those and steal your phone number and redirect notifications to their own devices. They can do this by either calling the phone carrier or walking into the store and pretending to be you. So it's not quite as secure as the apps. Our authenticator apps are the most secure option because they're not based on your phone number. So if someone hijacks your SIM, it doesn't matter. It produces some challenges when changing phones. 
Some of them do a good job of porting it over, others not so much. If any of you have had an RSA token in the past or do now, where you've got that keychain with the number that's constantly cycling through, it's the new form of that, where you've got it on your phone instead of having to keep track of that keychain. They refresh every 30 or 60 seconds, depending on which one you're using. The best part is they don't require a cell service or an internet connection, so you can use them to log into accounts when your cell service is spotty. Now, of course, most of your accounts require an internet connection to log into, but we know sometimes that we've got Wi-Fi available um, with courthouses when we don't have great cell service. The three primary players in this field are Google Authenticator, Authy, and your password manager, if you have one, may work well for this. Google Authenticator is great because you can use a camera to add a QR code and then you can name each token. It's fairly easy to change phones with that, but it doesn't have support for multiple devices, which might be a good thing, right? You only want your phone to be able to unlock the account. But if you have a legitimate reason for sharing an account with someone, it means that they both can't get the code and then you end up texting each other back and forth to get codes, which isn't ideal. Authy gives you a cloud backup, making it super easy to swap devices and it supports multiple devices. So if you need two people to have access to the account, you can get them both that code so that they can both get in there. While we're talking about passwords, if you don't have yourself a password manager, you probably want to get one. One of the most common problems with passwords is that as humans, we can't remember a unique password for every single account that we have. As a result, most people reuse passwords. They put them in a Word document, an Excel file, or they write them down and put them in their desk drawer. The biggest issue with reusing passwords is what happens when one of those passwords gets hacked somewhere. A bunch of big name places have had all of their passwords revealed. They're available on the dark web. And what the bad actors do is they take your email address and your password from there and they start trying to use them in other places because they know people reuse passwords. So once one of your reused passwords is compromised one place, it's compromised everywhere and you need to change it everywhere. Password managers, a lot of them will let you know if one of yours has been compromised. What they also allow you to do is get one super secure password backed up with two-factor authentication to open up all of your passwords. You can generate new passwords that are completely random and therefore as secure as possible for all of your accounts, eliminating the need to reuse passwords. Up next, let's talk a little bit about encryption because it's really important not only that we have a secure password to lock everything down, we have two-factor authentication turned on, but our data is encrypted. There's two forms of encryption. The first is that our data is encrypted at rest. When it's just sitting there being stored, everything's encrypted and secured. It's pretty basic of a requirement, but you absolutely need to make sure that your data is encrypted at rest. And then the other, is that it be encrypted in transit as you are uploading or downloading the data. So if you are sending an email, right, it goes through the internet and is in transit on its way to the other person's computer. Same thing when we access anything else online. So we need it to be encrypted in transit as well. Now, once you make sure that your provider is going to have your data encrypted at rest and in transit, you want to think about who holds the key. So there's this whole encryption key that unscrambles the data and it all just automatically works. And that's what protects us from other people hacking in and getting the data, right? They get the data, it's encrypted. They don't have the key. They can't unscramble it. Sometimes you hold the key, which means you're responsible for it. Sometimes the service provider holds it. And the thing you want to think about is subpoenas. If your service provider is subpoenaed, will they respond and turn over your data along with the encryption key? 
if you have the encryption key and they don't, they can respond to the subpoena, but all of your data will be encrypted. And so they won't be able to make sense of it. So just something to think about. Different service providers go different ways on who holds the key. Now that we've gotten a bunch of our security needs out of the way, let's go back to our steps. And step one is client intake. We're gonna be talking about scheduling, retainer agreements, and our intake forms, and how we can do all of that to better support our DIY loving clients. We wanna make sure for scheduling that people can schedule from a link. There are services out there like Microsoft Bookings or Calendly that allow people to schedule time with you or someone at your office the same way they would schedule a fitness class or a hair appointment where they don't have to pick up the phone and call or exchange emails back and forth. We've all done it, right? Can you come in Tuesday at 10 a.m.? Oh, no, sorry, I've got a doctor's appointment then. All right, can you come in Wednesday at 3 or Thursday at 9 a.m., right? And there's a ton of back and forth. Or they have to call you. They have to make sure they get through to someone at the office. They might be put on hold for a while. It might go to voicemail. You might have to return the call, right? There is a lot of administrative burden when it comes to scheduling things by email or phone. So if we can do it through a service like Microsoft Bookings or Calendly, they will come to a page that looks like this. They will be able to click on a date that potentially works for them and see what times are available to be selected. They can't actually see what's on your calendar. They can just see when you're available to be scheduled. It integrates with your Microsoft 365 calendar. So if you don't have Microsoft 365, that includes Exchange, which is the magic that makes your email appear on your phone and your desktop and Outlook on the web, and you move things in one place and it moves in the other. That magic is Exchange. Back in the day, have an Exchange server. Either you had a server closet at your office, right? Maybe you still do with an Exchange server, or you paid someone else to take care of the Exchange server for you. You don't have to worry about any of that anymore. With Microsoft 365, almost all of their business and enterprise plans come with Exchange. There are three different Microsoft business plans. Now this is separate from the enterprise plans, which we're gonna talk about in just a moment. And separate from the home plans, which is what you would be using for your personal computer at home. Our three business plans are the Microsoft 365 Business Basic, the Microsoft 365 Apps for Business, and the Microsoft 365 Business Standard. You'll see they range in price from $5 a month to $12.50 a month. The primary difference is whether you get Microsoft Exchange and whether you get desktop applications. For $5 a month, you get Microsoft Exchange, that magic that syncs up your email everywhere. For $8.25 a month, you get your desktop applications, Microsoft Outlook, Word, Excel, and PowerPoint installed locally with the full feature set on your computer, but you don't get Exchange. You need the Microsoft 365 Business Standard for $12.50 a month to get all of that. For those of you looking for an enterprise plan, you've got both an E3 and an E5 plan. The F3 plan is for frontline workers, which is not what your typical law firm needs. The primary difference between E3 and E5 is the security tools that they make available to you. However, some of the apps are only available for the E5 customers. So if there's particular apps that you're interested in, make sure they're going to be available to you at the plan you go with. So make sure you've got a Microsoft 365 plan that includes Exchange so you can take advantage of Bookings or Calendly. If you want to go with Microsoft Bookings, make sure it's available in your plan before you go ahead and get your subscription. The best part is you're not at the mercy of whenever anyone wants to schedule you. It's gonna see when you're not available on your calendar, anytime you have anything booked, you can institute other rules. So you could say that you don't want any appointments before 10 a.m. or after 3 p.m. or you wanna break for lunch every day from 2 to 1. You can set up different 
pages with different types of services, they call them. So maybe you have a one hour in-person meeting or an initial client meeting and you have a 30 minute Zoom conference, right? There's all different ways and lengths of time we meet with clients in different places these days. We can set up separate pages for that or we can even list them all on one business page and let someone select. We can also add in multiple staff for these and they could either select the staff member they want to meet with. So if you've got three different attorneys who do that sort of appointment, you could have them select from it or you could have it randomly assigned on the back end or you could have one page per staff member. You can ask custom fields to get more information from people and you can send them text and email reminders. And you can also have it set up buffer time so that you don't end up in a whole bunch of back-to-back -back meetings and it'll actually put the calendar appointment for longer on your calendar than it does on them with Microsoft Booking. So for example, if they book an 11 to noon appointment and you say you want half an hour of buffer time before the appointment, it'll actually book it on your calendar from 10.30 to noon and there's 11 to noon so that you don't get anything scheduled over that time. Now Calendly is even more popular than Microsoft Bookings, but if you already have a Microsoft 365 enterprise plan, it probably includes bookings. And I am all about getting the most out of what you're already paying for. But if you don't have that level of plan with Microsoft, you're still going to need Exchange through Microsoft for Calendly to work, or it works with Google Calendar if you are a Google Workspace user. They've got a free plan. It's really limited, but it's a great way to try it out. And it goes up to around $12 per month. That gets you text message notifications, page redirects so you can send people back to your website after they book, all sorts of integrations and custom colors. But all of this is gonna make it so much easier for someone to schedule time with you. They wake up at 2 a.m. and they're like, oh, I need to talk to my attorney and they wanna put time on the calendar, they can do it then. They can see all the different times that you're available and pick the one that's most convenient for them. Up next, let's talk about retainer agreements, right? Hopefully we are all sending those to clients that we want to engage in representing. Old school, we'd have them sign a piece of paper, right? Maybe they'd sign it while they were in our office, but more often than not, we'd end up mailing it to them and then they'd mail it back to us. So many people don't have stamps anymore. When they want to do everything electronically, they don't want paper. They don't want to deal with that. They don't want to come back to your office to drop it off. You might say, well, that's great. I'm going to email it to them. They can sign it. They can scan it back in and send it to me. The problem is they don't have printers. People with printers at home are few and far between. Maybe they can get away with printing it at work. Maybe not. We don't want to put them in that sort of position. Make it easy for them to sign from their computer or even their mobile device, their iPad, their iPhone, their Android tablet or smartphone. There's a lot of options out there. There's HelloSign, DocuSign, Write Signature, Adobe Sign. They all make it incredibly simple to work with. They look like this, right? They've got a little flag that says, hey, you need to sign here. Someone clicks, they type their name, they sign it, and then they just click their way through the documents to sign them. If you have got Adobe Acrobat DC, you have got Adobe Sign included with your subscription. Now, you've got a limited number of documents you can send out per year. For most lower volume practices, it'll be sufficient. You've got over 100 you can send per year. Now, if you do a lot of digital signatures, right? Maybe it's low volume, but you have a lot that get signed. You can get additional ones from Acrobat. You could also go with something like DocuSign that costs in the neighborhood of 10 to $40 a month, depending on which plan you go with, which all has to do with how many documents you need per month. But go with one of those. It's super easy to get set up and it's super easy for your clients to use. And there's no exchange of paper whatsoever. Let's talk about our intake forms. There's a lot of information that most attorneys need to collect at the beginning of the representation. At a bare minimum, you need your client's name, 
address, phone number, and email address. But more often, we're collecting a lot of information that's gonna make it easier for us to represent them. If we're in family law, we're getting their spouse's name, their children's name, a whole lot of information about their assets, their debts. If we're in estate planning, we're getting information about their heirs and those that they want to leave their property to, people that they want to manage their trust or be the executor of their estate. If we're in litigation, there's a whole bunch of different parties we need to collect, probably some important dates. And so we don't want to give clients paper to hand write on. A lot of times we give them a piece of paper when they come in for their initial meeting or their second meeting, and we say, write down all of this. We'll give you a clipboard. We'll see you in 20 minutes, right? Just like a doctor's office or at least doctor's office is used to. Then is clients don't want to handwrite. Their handwriting is hard to read and they might not have all of that information with them. Maybe they've got contacts with addresses on their phone. Maybe they don't. Maybe they need to email their kids and ask them what their address is. Why not allow them to do it from their home easily when it's convenient for them? Now, we want to make sure that whatever method we choose for our client intake forms, we're in compliance with all of our ethical duties. We want to make sure that we don't end up with any sort of conflict of interest issues. So if we're going to put our client intake form on our website to make it easy for people to find, we want to make sure that we don't end up with a problem if someone who hasn't talked to us fills it out and maybe we have a conflict of interest with them. So we might not want to put it on our website, even though that would make it super easily accessible. Maybe it's a link we have to email people, even though that's less than ideal. Common options include things like form or survey tools, things like Microsoft Forms, Google Forms, SurveyMonkey. There's a whole bunch of them out there that allow you to put these forms together to collect information. You may need to sign a business associate agreement with them to make sure you've got the level of security that you need. So make sure you do your research on their current policies and that you stay up to date with them. You may also want to consider something like document automation tools that allow you to do more with the data on the back end, which we're going to talk about in just a minute. But so here you can see an example of Microsoft Forms. Some of the issues with a lot of these form tools, though, is that you can't really collect a list. I need to get a name of all of your children or a list of all of your assets. And I could put in a large comment box and have people type it. But when it comes to figuring out what to do with that data and being able to transform it and move it into things like a case or matter management system, it would be ideal if those were all separate fields. But the problem is someone may have no children and someone else could have nine children. And so trying to figure out the right number of fields to ask can cause some problems. There are free and pro versions of all of these. Sometimes it's only the pro version that is secure. So you want to check those out. There may be a cost for so many surveys a month, if you have the free version, you can only do so many. Pro versions tend to include more formatting options, more personalization options. They do things like allow you to hide questions and do what's called branching or smart forms, where a lot of these like Microsoft Forms and SurveyMonkey at the very least allow you to say, hey, if you answered this question a certain way, I'm gonna skip ahead several questions. So we could have a question up front that says, are you married? State planning client makes a big difference if they're married, the type of information we need to collect. Because if they're married, we definitely need their spouse's information. But maybe we don't want to show questions about a spouse if someone's single. And so we could have a yes, no, are you married? Or a multiple choice, married or single select. And then if they pick single or they say, no, they're not married, it skips ahead a whole section, reducing the amount of scrolling they have to do through the form. 
We can typically export individual answers into Excel from these tools, allowing us to manipulate the data further. A lot of times we can embed surveys, we can set up custom email templates. And if you're using Microsoft Forms, they have this whole Power Automate tool, which we're not gonna get into in this hour, but it allows you to do really powerful things between Microsoft and other applications, allowing you to send data all around, send off email alerts, all sorts of cool things. Now, if you're looking at maybe doing document automation software because we want some bigger advantages, we can set it up to ask very similar questions, but we have more control a lot of times over what the order of the questions are, how they are grouped, what appears and disappears. They allow you to do lists so we could collect as many children as we need to without showing a whole bunch of additional options. Some of the bigger players in the field there that do a nice job with client interviews include HotDocs Advance and Express Docs. And then of course you can use these to automate your documents and spend less time drafting documents, which is always good. Let's talk about how to use client portals to share information with our clients. Client portals are typically built into our case or matter or practice management system. The place where we store all of our matter information. If you don't have a matter management system and you want to be able to better collaborate with your clients, now is a great time to think about getting one. There are a ton of different ones out there. Generally speaking, with client portals, you can share information like messages, documents, notes, calendar events, and billing. It's one place where they can log in and find out everything that's going on in their case. Instead of calling or emailing you for a status update, they can log into the client portal and get all of that information at their fingertips. Now, not all practice management systems client portals are the same. A lot of them are different. Some only do documents, some only do billing, some only do messages, some do some of the above. So if you're looking at investing in a new system, take their client portal ability into account if that's one of the main reasons you're looking to get one. Now there's a million other reasons why you wanna get a case management system if you don't already have one. They allow you to keep all of your tasks in a centralized place, contacts in a centralized place, keep everything really well organized in a matter-centric way. The way that Outlook just can't because it's not how Outlook was designed. So these are great for sharing information and communicating with your clients. If you currently have a practice management system, see what it has available. It might not be able to do everything you want, but it's definitely the first place to start. Let's talk a little bit more in detail about sharing documents. Even if you decide to use a client portal with a practice management system, it may or may not meet your document sharing needs. When I'm talking about sharing documents, I'm not just talking about sharing individual documents, but creating a shared document location. So clients can not only upload files to it, you can upload them and you can both edit Microsoft Word documents or fillable PDFs if you have a need for that. Those of you who have a document management system, the big name players are NetDocuments, iManage, and WorldDocs, they may have this feature already built in. Now, it might not be included with your subscription level. You may need to go up a level or pay for an add-on, but these work really, really well. NetDocuments has collab spaces. Essentially what happens is you create a licensed external account for your client. You get admin control over these accounts and it gives you a space within a NetDocuments workspace for collaboration. With iManage, they have Share. It integrates with iManage Work and Outlook and WorldDocs has their WorldDocs Connect. If you don't have a document management system, and there's a bunch of reasons to get a document management system, it allows you to search for your documents so much easier and gives you so much more control over the storage and finding of your grand history of documents and file retention. But if you don't have that, you might want to use a document sharing service. One of the popular ones is ShareFile. 
With ShareFile, you can create shared folders that allows someone to access any documents put in there and upload their own documents. So you could create a shared folder for each client. You also have the ability with ShareFile to send documents securely with their Outlook add-in, requiring people to log into their ShareFile account to access it. Now they get a free ShareFile account to do that, and it's a few more hoops for them to jump through, but it's more secure than sending it as a regular Outlook email attachment. You can also use their Outlook add-in to send links to securely request files and get a notification when files are uploaded. So if you need someone to send you a whole bunch of discovery and you need a secure location for that, or the very least a place for them to dump it all because you don't want it all in a bunch of email attachments, you can use ShareFile for that. You can also use their Windows Explorer add-in called Citrix Files. So you get ShareFile as essentially just another network drive, and you can use that for the storage of your documents. Other ways to create shared file locations include some of our file services like OneDrive, which is included with your Microsoft 365 license, or Dropbox, where you can create shared folders in either of these and allow clients to upload and download files from there. There's also Box and a whole bunch of other competitors out there. Let's talk next about getting paid. The two tricks here for our DII clients are to do a flat fee as much as possible and to make it super easy for them to pay you. The real reason why you want to do it flat fee in terms of our DIY clients is that people want to know what it's going to cost. In fact, one of the big reasons why a lot of people don't want to hire attorneys is because of the hourly fee arrangement. They're afraid to call their lawyer because it's going to cost them money to call their lawyer. They don't know how many hours it's going to take to resolve their matter and how much it's going to end up costing them. So if you can do it flat fee, they know how much it's going to cost up front and it makes it all the easier for them to budget and to agree to want to pay you. Now, you might not be able to do everything for flat fee, right? Litigation, not so easy to do for flat fee. You got clients who call you up constantly. Maybe you need incentive for them to call you less often. Charging them for those calls is one way to do it. You can probably create a menu of flat fee services so that they know what specific things are going to cost. So for estate planning, for example, you could have one cost for just doing someone's health care directives. You could have a different cost for doing their health care directives and their basic will. And then you could have a third package that includes a basic trust and a pour over will. Now, you want to give them advice on what it is they're going to need, but then they know what it's going to cost them to get exactly what they need. And you could charge hourly in addition to the flat fee, right? Just be clear in your engagement agreement what is and isn't included in the flat fee. Now, ideally, when you're charging flat fees, you want to get paid up front. However, you might need to set up a payment schedule, right? Maybe half up front, half on delivery of the documents. Just make sure you spell it all out in the engagement agreement. Make sure, even though you're going flat fee, that you still track your time. And I know, everyone hates to track their time in six-minute increments, right? It's really a drag. But the reason why you want to do this is because you want to know your hourly rate. That way, you can adjust your flat fees accordingly. If right now you bill $200 per hour, if you start charging $2,000 for a basic will, you'll know if you're coming in at less than 10 hours per basic will that you're actually improving your bottom line and you are making more money per will. But if it's actually taking you 17 hours, you're coming in at a lot lower effective hourly rate. And you want to know that to make sure that you adjust your amounts as new engagements come in. So keep tracking all of that time. Now, the more you can do to automate everything, the easier it's going to be to get those hours down and the greater your profit's going to be. We really want to make sure that we are set up 
to work as efficiently as possible so that we can get the highest hourly rate possible. And a lot of this is going to involve automation, which is only going to benefit you and your clients. First, you want to take stock of the tools you have available to you. Make a list of all of the software that you currently have bought up front or have a subscription for. Then you want to go and dive into all of the features each of those has. And that can be kind of an overwhelming thing to do, right? There are a lot of features and the average user probably uses less than 10% of the features available to them. Take Outlook, for example. If you're an Outlook user, I bet you're an Outlook all day, every day. But do you know what Outlook quick steps are? What about Outlook rules? Even if you know what Outlook quick steps and rules are, how often do you employ them? And that's just one piece of software. Microsoft Word, if that's your word processor of choice, do you take advantage of auto text, macros, styles to format your documents, templates that have perfect formatting and all the boilerplate language that you need and placeholders? Or are you drafting things by getting one that you recently did for another client, doing a find and replace, and then doing some custom drafting from there. Your practice management software. Do you know what all the different buttons do? Does it have workflows available? Are your workflows built into it? What about task automation? Your document management system, if you have one, may have a bunch of features you're not using. There's probably right-click menus and power views and power menus, and you're probably only using a small fraction of all of that. Same thing with your time billing and accounting software. Are you reviewing pre-bills by hand, marking them up, re-entering them, or are you doing that all digitally? So you'll probably discover you're barely scratching the surface of all of the software that you're using. You're going to want to get training on the features that you don't currently utilize. Some of the features you may not need. There's stuff in Word that's designed for people who are putting together marketing type things where we can put in borders and change colors that we don't normally need in a legal document. So we want to get training on the features that we need so that we can work more efficiently in those programs. And while we're doing all that, we want to take stock of all of our processes, starting with when we reach out to potential clients, our marketing efforts, our networking, then when potential clients contact us, what we do from there, all the way through to the end of the representation, when we send that final bill, when we get the documents there when we get the final documents to our client and any outreach we do afterwards to keep that client coming back for additional representation. We wanna document that all step by step by step. To do that accurately, you're gonna to need to talk to your people. Find out exactly what they do. We often have an idea of what we think our people are doing, and it turns out they're not actually doing it that way. In fact, maybe we created templates for them to use. And we would say the process is go to the template folder and open up the decree of divorce and fill in the missing information. And you talk to your people, and the formatting's all messed up on that document. And they're like, oh, it's such a nightmare to deal with. I just go back to the one I drafted most recently. Or it doesn't have all of the current language in there. The language is out of date. It's not current with local rules and federal law updates. There's a whole host of reasons why they may not be doing what you think they are doing. So talk to them and get it down in the nitty gritty detail. Not only is this going to help you figure out how to improve your processes, but when it comes to onboarding new people, the more you have documented accurately, the easier it's going to be to onboard them. You can show them and then pull up the documentation and say, hey, here's a step by step reference on how we do things around here. Then once you've documented your processes, then, once you've documented your processes, you want to look for bottlenecks. There's a few different ways you can find bottlenecks. If you're not currently largely paperless, you can look around the office and figure out where the stacks of paper are. Back when I was practicing law, 
We all had stacks of paper on our desk, documents to review, notes on documents to draft. There's a stack of papers that need scanned, a stack that need filed in the physical folders. You could see where the bottlenecks were based on where all of the paper was piled up. Look at time entries. If you use activity codes and you can report on those, you can see what activity is taking the most amount of time. Now, it may be that your assistants and paralegals have some bottlenecks and they might not be billing for those. So time entries aren't foolproof. So just keep that in mind, but it's always good to do things based on data we have available. Talk to your people. What's frustrating them? What's making their job more challenging? Be ready to hear that you could be part of the problem, right? It could be you reviewing the documents or you giving them instructions or giving them inadequate instructions. So that way you can tackle the bottlenecks, tackle the challenges and the frustrations to make your processes more efficient. Now, make sure as you improve your processes that you're updating the documentation so that it remains accurate. You can do things as simply as putting numbered steps in Microsoft Word, things that are related to software. I'd go ahead and put annotated screenshots in there. You can use your snipping tool that came with Windows or the new snipping tool that they call Snip and Sketch. You can also use programs like Snagit that have a whole bunch of annotation tools in them, I'm a huge fan of Snagit personally. If you don't want to use Word, you could use Visio or Visio-like programs like Lucidchart or Smartsheet. Those all work incredibly well for documenting processes. Then you want to make sure that everyone is engaged in the highest and best use of their time whenever possible. If it doesn't require an attorney to do it, have your paralegal or assistant do it. If they're not required to do it and your clients are willing to do it, have your clients do it and then it doesn't take up any of your time. Then finally, you wanna look at all of this. All of the technology you have, what features are available that you're not using and start using those, but figure out what technology you need. For example, when it comes to document drafting, it could be that your practice management software has some document automation capabilities. It could take your client's name and address and drop them into the caption of your pleading. It could put the opposing party in there. It might even be able to make paragraphs come in and out depending on the facts of the case. But one area where we often run into issues when it comes to automating documents is that we don't have all of the answers in our practice management software. There's simply more information that we need to have that it doesn't make sense to store in our practice management software. And so we might be looking for more advanced document automation. There might be document automation programs that integrate with your practice management software. For example, Clio has a Lawyer integration that's fantastic. It can integrate with Woodpecker through Zapier. We've got other ones that integrate with Hotdocs. Some integrate with Express Docs. So look what integrates so that you can reduce the amount of data entry you're doing. And if these happen to have client interviews, all the better. Or maybe you've got something like Clio and you can use Clio Grow to do some client intake and then transfer all that over to your Clio Matters. But look for areas where we can harness technology and get new technology in place. Even if it means an upfront investment, we've got to get our software onboarded, we've got to set it up, we've got to do customizations, maybe we need to further customize the software that we have. If it means fewer hours towards those flat fees, we're gonna be all the more profitable in the long run. We wanna make it easy for them to pay. So not only are they gonna know what it's gonna cost them, because as much as possible is flat fee and discussed upfront, they don't want to have to stop into our office to run the credit card, call with their credit card, or mail a check. In fact, many of them don't even have checks on hand anymore. We've got a whole bunch of rules as attorneys when it comes to trust accounting. So we might not be able to use just any old credit card processing vendor because we need the money to go into our trust account frequently, but we can't have the fees come out of our trust account, right? That's why we have a trust and an operating account. The great news is 
LawPay, one of the big credit card processors in the legal industry, understands all of this. They work with countless law firms around the country, and so they are really a clear choice. They allow you to add a payment link on your website, which is great. So people can just go to your website, click on a link and pay. You can also put a payment link on your invoices, send those out by PDF and they can pay from there. They allow you to also run credit card transactions from a computer or a mobile device. So if someone is in the office and needs to pay, you can handle it there. You don't have to go to the website and put it in there. You can schedule payments for people on a payment plan and just in general, make it so much easier for your clients to pay you, which is worth every single penny. On to step four, let's talk about how to let clients engage in as much self-help as possible. The first thing you want to allow them to do is to provide data themselves. So we talked about client intake forms, but we might need them to provide more than what we would collect at the beginning of the representation. And then we might go so far as to selling templates and competing with legal zoom. For data entry, we want to let them type it themselves. And if we want to pre-populate documents with it and take advantage of document automation to truly leverage their data entry, and to minimize the amount of time it takes us to draft those documents so we can get a greater return on those flat fees, we're gonna look for document automation software that does client interviews. Some of our more popular options out there is HotDocs Advance and Express Docs. Both of those will allow you to send client interviews to clients and you could actually set it up where they could draft the entire document themselves, just send you the data, have you send the document to them after you review it. Finally, let's talk about selling templates. So we're not just having them enter the data and then we assemble the document and send it back to them. Maybe we actually want to compete with LegalZoom. Now we want to be careful about the ethical duties with all the different jurisdictions that we practice in. We want to make sure we don't have any issues with conflicts of representation or issues with giving competent legal advice. But there's law firms all over the country who are starting to do this. And you might be able to do it to sell more than just templates. You might be able to sell a template with help text because people need advice on how to draft their will or how to draft their dissolution of marriage. And so maybe we have a template with some advice on when to pick option A over option B. That can be incredibly valuable. We might also want to sell a template plus legal advice. So maybe we put together a package, draft your own will using my document automation software, but then you get a one hour consult to review what you've got there. Or maybe do that hour consult first, and then they go and draft their own document. The sky's the limit in what sort of packages you can put together. You might need to advise them on which template they need because different situations call for different templates, right? You might wanna review it with them after it's complete. And then maybe they'll want you to represent them in court. Maybe they're going to draft their initial documents, but then they need a lawyer at the end of the day. Or maybe they want to help you negotiate things. So you can put together all sorts of different creative packages where they are really paying for your advice, but they're not paying for the actual assembly of the documents. A lot of places, it's a lot of boilerplate, right? Now, maybe you've got 20 different versions of the first paragraph in a will, and which one of those you pick affect 10 other paragraphs throughout the will. Document a Document automation software can absolutely help with all of that. You just need to make sure you pick the right powerful tool and you provide the right guidance to your clients. Let's put it all together. What would the ideal client experience look like for one of these DIY clients? Well, to start with, they'll be able to schedule an initial consult 
on your website. They're potentially interested in retaining you. They don't necessarily have to pick up the phone and call and see if someone's available. They could schedule a call or a Zoom meeting or a trip into your office. Now, if you do put that on your website, make sure you collect enough information to be able to do a conflict check before you actually meet with them, or maybe only have an initial call available where you can run that conflict check where you can then get the next meeting set up. Then, once they're ready to engage you, you've met, you send them an engagement agreement that they can digitally sign through DocuSign, Write Signature, Hello Sign, Adobe Sign, click in a few places. And that engagement agreement includes a flat fee that they know exactly how much that representation is going to cost. They also get a link to your credit card processing company, such as LawPay, where they can click they can pay whenever they want, two in the morning if they want to. You don't have to be in your office to answer the phone. Then they fill out a form that you send them to get the initial information you need to advise them. If they need to schedule additional calls with you, they've got a link to set up those calls when it's convenient for you or Zoom meetings or trips into your office. When it comes time to draft documents, Either you already have the document information that you need to draft them and you've got automation software set up to efficiently draft those, potentially pulling in information from your practice management system, or you're able to send them a link and they're able to draft the documents themselves through a guided client interview. And perhaps they never talked to you in the first place because they just jumped ahead, gave you money and purchased that. At the end of it all, they've got professional looking documents that work well in Microsoft Word. You've given them the very best advice possible in the minimum amount of time possible. They've saved money. They've taken a lot of the administrative burdens off of your hands, and we've let technology take care of it most of all. Before we finish up, I know some of you might be excited to get a practice management system that has a client portal or be able to start taking advantage of all the features that a credit card processor like LawPay has to offer. As a Tennessee Bar Association member, I want to make sure you're aware of some of your member benefits available for some savings there. Firstly, as a Tennessee Bar Association member, you get 10% off a lifetime subscription to Clio. Clio is a very well-known cloud-based practice management system. They happen to have a fantastic client portal that you can use to share notes with your clients, communicate with them, share documents, do billing, all of the things that we would want to do in a client portal. Portal. So make sure you're getting your discount there if you decide to sign up for Clio. As for LawPay, you can get a discount as a Tennessee Bar Association member on their processing fees. And it's always good to save money whenever we can. So take advantage of your Tennessee Bar Association member benefits. If you guys have any questions, feel free to email me, ddavisrow at affinityconsulting.com. I would be happy to answer all of your questions. Thank you for attending today.